Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. On today's video, we have a repair, and it's of this Commodore Amiga 500. This machine was donated to me by local viewer, Steven. He said it wasn't working, and that's really all I know about it. So in this video, I'm gonna to try to figure out what's wrong with it and then fix it. So without further ado, let's get right to it. If you follow me on Twitter, I actually posted about this particular machine asking, what's the deal with this keyboard layout? Steven, who gave me this machine, really didn't have any backstory on the machine. He got this given to him as well, so he just sort of passed it on to me. Other than the fact that it doesn't work, he didn't really know much else about this. Condition-wise, this computer is in really good shape. If we flip it over, it does have the trap door. I haven't even looked under there. I'm assuming it's gonna have 512K memory card. The side door is missing though, and I actually don't know what this little metal kind of RF shield clip thing is. I've never seen that on any of the Amiga 500s I have. There is a sticker for the warranty on this 500 and it has been broken, so someone has been in this machine at least once before. I noticed on this machine there's a warning sticker, but it's in English, so I thought that was a bit unusual if this was from Spain. But apparently Commodore used English on this sticker on all regions where the computer was sold. Before I turn this machine on, I'm gonna take a look under the trap door here just to see if there's a card installed. And actually, there isn't even a memory card installed. That's not necessarily a bad thing because those memory cards almost always have a clock battery on them, which can leak and, and cause a bit of a mess. I have connected up all the cables, so let's turn this on. What do we see? Ah, immediately we get a green screen. Now, if you Google for color codes for Amiga Diagnostics, like what we're seeing right here, I found that the color that's being shown is different for the same error, depending on if you have a Kickstart 1.3 or a 2.0 ROM. I know this firsthand because I had an Amiga 500 with bad RAM, and I can't remember, but it was showing either a yellow or a red screen at power up. And all the guides I had looked at said that I think green was bad RAM. And I was pulling my hair out trying to figure out what was going on. Well, it turned out that I had Kickstart 2.0 in that Amiga 500, and all those guys were seemingly for Kickstart 1.3. Since this computer has never actually worked, I don't really know the actual Kickstart ROM that's installed in here. So next thing we need to do is simply open this thing up and just take a look at that. There's something I just noticed when I turned on the Amiga 500 is that this being a Spanish machine, you think it would be running in PAL, but actually that was running in NTSC. I could just tell by the way the monitor looked. Perhaps Commodore sold the Amiga 500 with a Spanish layout in Mexico, but with NTSC, because of course that's the TV standard used there. If any of my viewers can confirm or deny that Commodore actually sold machines down in Mexico, localized for Mexico, I'd love to know if that's the case. All right, we're in like Flynn. Things are a little dirty in here. I mean, that's of course expected. The computer is definitely not new or anything like that. The keyboard is a Mitsumi branded keyboard, but it says made in Malaysia. And unfortunately, these types of keyboards are membrane keyboards. So underneath here, there's actually like a, a double membrane. I don't know how reliable these are. I have a couple other Amiga 500s, US models. They totally work perfectly, but I'm quite wary anytime I see a membrane keyboard, like thinking that it's going to fail sooner than later. Whoever was inside this machine before definitely replaced all the RF shielding. So there's, there's that. With the shield removed, the motherboard is revealed. This is the RAM right here. There are four chips to make up the 512K. These chips are 44 256 chips. So each one of these chips is 256K times four bits. So two of them is 256K times eight bit. And of course this is a 16 bit machine. So you really do need 16 bit wide memory, which requires four chips because each one is four bits, remember? And it's 256K, 256K for a total of 512K. Now it does say here 512K slash one megabyte RAM, and there's empty spots on the motherboard here. I need to look this up because I haven't looked into this, but maybe there's a way to easily add an extra 512K of RAM to have a total of one megabyte. Now it's always a little bothersome that Commodore puts lots of sockets on the larger ICs on this machine, but they don't do it on the RAM. I have never seen an Amiga that had socketed RAM. We'll have to do some troubleshooting first to validate that it's definitely a RAM problem though. I don't wanna go just randomly desoldering these RAM chips first. The first thing I wanna do is look at this ROM chip here, check the markings on here so we can figure out what version of Kickstart is actually on this machine. The chip is marked with 315093-02 
All I had to do was a quick Google search and right away it comes up with that is definitely being a Kickstart 1.3 ROM. A quick Google search for the green screen issue definitely seems to confirm that at least, well, they don't specify what Kickstart versions, but if the Kickstart cannot find 256K of working chip RAM, then you'll get the green screen. Now, if we're trying to fix RAM problems on the Amiga, there's a couple different tactics you can take. Now, one of them is, of course, just replacing the ROM chip with the Amiga Diag ROM. It's an open source project to kind of do diagnostics. I don't know what it would do in the case of bad RAM or whatever is wrong with this computer. Would it actually reveal anything on screen or not? I don't know. But I do have a Kickstart 2.04 ROM here. I want to put this in this machine. Let's see what happens when I do that. Let's see if that color changes. I'm not expecting swapping this ROM to actually fix anything. I just want to see if the green screen remains the same with this Kickstart ROM in here. Oh, we are still getting a green screen. So maybe my assumption that the color was different between the different ROMs was incorrect. Difference is, of course, you notice it goes blank and then comes back. I think the diagnostic routine is a little bit different with this later Kickstart ROM versus 1.3. Okay, Kickstart 1.3 is back in. Let's just make sure we're still getting the green screen. We are indeed. All right, first thing I wanna to do to see what's going on here is I'm just gonna feel to see if any of these chips are hot. I'm gonna let the machine run for a little while. All the ICs here seem fine. The Amiga is a pretty cool running machine and the date codes on this machine seems like it's around 1991. By their CSG or Commodore Semiconductor Group had pretty much figured out manufacturing and they make reliable chips by then. It was the it was the 80s when they were doing the 64s where things were kind of unreliable. All right, I think you know the drill. It's time to use the oscilloscope. I have up on the screen the oscilloscope running and I have the pinout. So up at the top here, pins one and two and also 19 and 18. Those are the four data pins. Now I'm pretty sure that this Amiga is running properly because the fact that the screen turns green is definitely a sign that the CPU is working. If we took the CPU or the ROM out, we'd have a totally black screen, which would imply that the machine is just not doing anything at all. Now, I think on the Amiga architecture, and I have to check the schematics to kind of refresh my memory, the chip memory, which is the 512K here, is connected directly to the Agnes chip right here. There's no buffer chip in between like a 74LS245 that could fail. So generally a RAM problem like this on a board that hasn't had any damage from battery leakage or whatever is usually gonna be bad RAM itself or potentially a bad Agnes chip. Now, there could be another chip on here that's causing a bus conflict or something, but I don't think that's necessarily the case. I would have to check the schematics first. Let's just go through and check all the data bus pins, see what we see here. All right, so we are at one volt per division, so there's the division lines. And when I'm on this particular line, uh, that doesn't look good at all. Now that could just be because the Amiga has given up on the memory. Let's turn the machine off and on. Let's see if we see any difference. No, that looks pretty bad right there. Let's check the next line on this chip. We're seeing exactly the same thing. Let's look at the address lines. So the address line, that's how the signal should look coming out of the RAM chips as well. So something's going on. Let's move over to this side of the chip. Uh, that is data line one and data line two looks the same. The next one, oh, all right. We see oh, a split second there where it did have a little activity. It's almost like the Amiga is trying to run diagnostics on these chips and then it gives up. And when it gives up, it just starts to float the data bus lines. And that would be the Agnes chip. The one thing we can do is switch to single shot mode, see if we see any activity here. And I think we do. Uh, as soon as we get that little bit of a flash, there we go. So that would be the initial boot sequence, probably trying to check for the presence of the RAM. So now that we know that that signal looks like that on that one line, let's use the same methodology to go through all the data bus lines and let's make sure we see a similar picture to that. All right, I moved down to data bus line three on that same chip. We have to wait for the computer to like restart itself basically to try a new cycle. I could also power cycle the power, but I gotta say that that looks a little weird in the low part there, but I don't quite know what it should look like yet. So let's go through the rest of these pins. All right, so this is on pin one here. And again, looks weird, I don't know. How about two? Okay, so this one looks exactly the same as I think three. Four and one looked a little different. It just, this part looks weird right here. I'm back on line four, the first one we looked at. Let's just see how this looks. Yeah, so see how that's high? Hmm, okay, let's go over to the next chip over. I'm just looking for things that are dramatically different. Okay, so all that up and down might be normal. So let's look at all the other lines. Let's see if we see all that up and down, which I assume is like data getting written or read from the chip. 
Okay, that one's just high. Hmm. All right, that one's high. That one's high as well. Let's just go back to the first chip. All right, a whole lot of up and down there. Like I said, I'm not exactly sure how this should look, so it's hard to compare, right? But for the most part, the signal we're seeing here looks relatively similar from one chip to another. I mean, sometimes this is up here, sometimes it's not. It's hard to tell what that's supposed to look like. I just went looking through my box of stuff and I found this. It's a bag of 44 256 DRAM. So that's the stuff that's on here. So what I'm gonna do next is the piggyback method. So piggyback method is where you take a chip and you overlay it on top of another chip on the motherboard. Now, if the chip on the motherboard is working properly, then the two of them will work together to basically drive the bus together. If the chip on the motherboard is bad or say it has a bad output driver, then the good chip can help it work. Basically, both chips are gonna be storing the information and then trying to drive it back onto the bus. It's a bit of a crapshoot to whether this is actually gonna work or not, but there it is, the chip is sitting on top of the other one. You wanna make sure that it's lined up perfectly and the chips are squeezing the one below so it actually is making good contact on all the pins. I'm just gonna hold it with my finger and turn on the machine and we're still getting the green screen, which you can't see, but there it is. So I'm gonna move this to the next chip over. Same thing, green screen again. The third chip, same exact thing. The final one, and same thing. Now, it's quite possible that there are more than one bad RAM chip, so I'm just gonna go for broke and I'm gonna piggyback all of them simultaneously. Now you might be asking why I would do this. It's really just to save the effort of having to desolder these chips because I don't really know if they're the actual culprit here or not. Of course, another possibility is the chips on the board are storing the data incorrectly and when the two chips try to write to the bus, they conflict with each other and the chip that's on the motherboard wins, which is why piggybacking might not work in all cases. In addition, of course, goes without saying there might be another fault on this motherboard causing this problem. But all four chips are piggybacked and I'm just gonna hold them all down. And we got a green screen still. Now I happen to have one of those diagnostic ROMs right here and I'm very tempted to install that into this motherboard. Problem is, it's difficult to make these chips. You can download the image, no problem. And you can buy these chips on AliExpress, which is what I did right here. But writing these is not super easy. Things like the Mini Pro can't just write to these EEPROMs. But unfortunately, piggybacking the RAM didn't help. Also, the oscilloscope doesn't reveal any problems. So I kind of feel like the next best thing is to try this. All right, ROM is in, let's power it up. Let's see what it does. Now I don't know, of course it's flashing these colors here, so I'm gonna have to go look up what that means. This might be like a flash code, like the dead test on the Commodore 64, or it's trying to tell us that like which bit is wrong specifically, which will kind of give us a hint as to what chip might be bad on here. What's weird is it's got these bars now, so that's a bit strange, but I looked online here and it says here the flash codes, green red flashing is chip mem errors, which kind of is what we already knew, right? From the green background. There are other color codes there, like for bus error, address errors, illegal instructions, et cetera, et cetera. Let's power cycle this again and let it do another diagnostic cycle. Chip mem error. So unfortunately, I think all there is to do at this point is take these chips out and socket them. And then maybe we could be able to figure out with some of these replacement chips, which one is bad, if any. All right, so poking around with the diagnostic ROM in here might have actually revealed a potential issue. I don't know for sure if it is, but it might be. So if we power on the computer and we take a look at the data lines on the oscilloscope, there's different activity than with the standard Kickstart ROM. And you see there, there's a mostly low with a little bit of pulsing, and then we have a high pulse. And all the lines basically look like that on all the chips. See, there's a little bit of activity going on there. It's the same everywhere. That one's a little less activity, but that might be normal. But yeah, you kind of see pulses and stuff like that. So again, it's like that on all the lines everywhere, except this one. This one right here, it's inverted, which is just weird. I don't quite get that. Um, if we power cycle the machine, it just right away goes to that invertedness. So I'm not really sure that that's a problem. Let's check the right signal on this pin. I don't know how it's writing. So it seems to write to these chips in pulses. And I'm wondering when we look here, the right pulse might line up with this little dropped section here. In fact, if I just get another probe, 
we can check that out ourselves. The right signal, which is the yellow trace, doesn't seem to coincide with, well, anything. And when I say write signal, when the Agnes chip wants to write to the memory, it has to pull the write signal down to ground. And then whatever's on the data pins on the RAM chips is actually saved into the RAM chip. Now, of course, the RAS and CAS lines have to be busy doing stuff as well. But when we look here, it doesn't seem like this is a write here. So you would think almost like this is a read. All right, well, I'm kind of guessing. I'm just going to put a mark on this IC right here. And that's the one I'll change first. I do have to admit, unfortunately, I'm taking a shot in the dark because I don't really have an idea of what's going on here. Kind of shows that I'm a lot less experienced at these 16-bit machines than I am with 8-bit machines. Not to mention with these, it's running at 8 megahertz, so the clock speed's a lot higher. It's just a lot harder to catch what's going on exactly. All right, we have a jump cut, and I've gone ahead and I installed eight sockets on the motherboard, and I put the original RAM back into the original sockets where it was located. While I was working on the desoldering, I did a little bit of research, and it seems like this particular Agnes chip, which is the... 8732A actually supports a one meg of chip memory. I haven't quite figured out if I just install the memory that I'll have a meg total. Well, of course, that's if this machine works. Just from the preliminary research I did, there's some jumpers on this board that I think I may need to alter to make the chip recognize all one megabyte of RAM. But I also saw that there's a couple jumpers you can modify to make it recognize the memory that's plugged into the memory expansion slot here as chip memory. So you get a total of one megabyte. All right, I think I'm getting a little ahead of myself. I'm just gonna plug the power and the video cable back in. I just wanna see if the motherboard is behaving exactly the same as it was before I started all the work. Anytime you remove chips from a board, you do risk damaging the PCB. You can lift traces or cause other issues. My method of using the desoldering iron first to get out as much solder as possible and then using hot air to remove the chips using this little pick here to lift them out very gently pretty much guarantees 100% success rate, at least for me, on not damaging the board. And that was definitely the case here. I did take a quick look when I was done removing the chips and everything looked perfect. So I anticipate at this point, when I turn the power back on, we'll be in exactly the same situation we were in before, except now I can try to figure out which of these chips, if any, are bad. So let's hit the power switch. That's weird, it started out red, uh, and then it goes right into this cycle of green, red, I know there's a black flash in the middle of that too, but I think that's what it was doing before. All right, I can use these sockets here for quick and easy testing of the data bus lines. So, so far that chip looks exactly the same. This one, oh, went into this flashy mode. I gotta reset the power when it does that. Okay, that looks the same. Oh, look, this one is exactly the same. So that's this chip right here, which I thought was potentially problematic. It's giving us that inverted signal. And uh, that one looks the same, 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 same. And these are all the same. Now, like, the reason why you could use these sockets for testing, of course, is that there are 16 data bits on this machine, right? 16 bit processor. So that each one of these two pairs of sockets has four bits, four, 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 and four. There will be extra RAS and CAS lines that run from the Agnes chip to these other sockets, but all the address lines and all the data bus lines are gonna be paralleled between these two pairs. Okay, let's shut the power off and let's remove the IC that has that one weird data bus line and we'll stick in one of the new chips here. And let's start the power. And we're still getting the colors as if it's bad. So let's test that pin. It's still inverted. Okay, so I guess that is not a fault. That's just the way the machine is. I mean, I suppose there still could be other chips that are bad. Okay, well, let's just change out uh, this chip one here. I'm gonna leave the new chip in the socket here for the second chip, and let's just keep replacing them until we figure out which one of these is bad, if any. All right, let's get the power up. Uh, Wait, that's different. That is totally different. Okay, I can't remember exactly what this Amiga test ROM does, but let's just wait a second. I think it gives you a black screen for a while while it tests memory before you start seeing any text. Well, I've been sitting here for a while and we just have a black screen, so I'm just gonna reset the power here. So what does that flashing green mean? It says on the color code that black and green means detecting chip memory, but clearly it's detecting it, but <laughs> not working. All right, let's, uh, I don't know, I'm just gonna change the next chip out. Let's go for chip number three. Okay, let's do this now. What happens? Similar flashing. Oh, look at this. Wait, so were multiple chips bad? 
So yeah, it says down here, chip memory, 512 kilobytes. I still have one of the original Siemens chips installed, number four. Let's try a combination to see if any of these chips work in the motherboard. All right, I put back in chip number two. That was the first one I changed out that I thought was bad. And maybe? So it seems like when the system was working after that green flashing, it brought up text much more quickly. So that chip is bad. All right, let me put back in the known good chip. See if we get back to text and the working system. Oh, there we go. Okay, let's try chip number one here. Is it possible that these Siemens chips are like the MT? Yeah, look at this, back to the flashing now. So that chip is definitely bad as well. Three out of the four RAM chips bad? Wow. Okay, so three new chips and just the old chip there. Let's see if that works. There it is, came right up. All right, I have the original bad RAM back in the motherboard and I have the chips in the exact same position that they were in originally before I desoldered them. And the reason why I'm doing this is because I know people are probably screaming at their screen watching me troubleshoot this machine that when you're using the Amiga Diag ROM like I am here, there is actually a serial port output, which incidentally I did not realize at the time. I've never troubleshooted bad RAM with this diagnostic ROM. And funnily enough, right on the page with all the color codes for this ROM, that little GitHub page I was looking at, right at the top it says, there is data output on the serial port to tell you what's going on. <laughs> if I had seen that, then I would have done this testing early on, but I didn't. So now it's time to go back and simulate what this was like with this bad RAM installed, and let's see what serial port information is output with this ROM chip. So up here on the screen, I have my putty terminal, and let's turn this on. Okay, so there it is. We have the color codes or the colors flashing on here, and we're seeing a whole bunch of stuff scrolling by on the screen. I'm just gonna turn it off so we can scroll back and take a look at what's going on here. All right, so it starts out here, Amiga Diagram version 121, and it's doing some initial initialization. And right here, it starts writing to address 400 hex to see if the memory on this board is working. Now, of course, the diagnostic routines beyond what it's doing right here need to have working memory to work. So of course, it's trying to initialize the RAM here, or it's trying to find the RAM and then initialize it so it can continue running. Now, keep in mind when you look at all these ones and zeros that there are actually 32 of them, and that's because this ROM is designed to run on 32-bit versions of the processor. This is only a 16-bit processor, so there's only 16 bits of RAM here. That means that only these bits I have highlighted, which is zero through 15 are relevant. 16 through 31 is just a replica of the lower bytes. It is possible for this processor, since it's actually a 32-bit processor internally, to make 32-bit writes to RAM. But on 16-bit versions like this, when you write 32 bits, it actually writes to the 16-bit RAM twice. Now back to what it's actually doing for diagnostics purposes. So it writes a bit pattern into the memory at this address uh, 400 hex, and then it immediately reads it back. And we can see here that when it writes 1010 and so on to the RAM, it reads back actually 1111, and then the rest is fine. So right off the bat, we can see even from this very first instruction that two bits are wrong. They are written with zeros, and it actually reads back a one. And this is bit 14, and this is bit 12. Now, if we go over to the schematics for this particular Rev 6A motherboard, which I found online, we can see right here that U19 is the chip that's got bit 14 and bit 12 on it. And it's this IC right here that is U19. So if I had known about the serial output or I had realized it's there and looked at it, immediately I would have known that this IC is bad. But so far this RAM diagnostic is only showing this chip as bad. So let's pop it out and switch in a known good chip Let's see what this thing does at that point. All right, so let's turn on the machine. Here it goes. Aha. So according to what we're looking at here, it looks like it tests out some of the memory. And then here it says it's found 16 32K blocks or 10 hex of chip memory that look good. But then it starts to go into a loop, testing if a serial loopback adapter is installed. It just says not detected. And it does that over and over and over again. It just prints D, 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 D. And if I turn the computer back on again, this is where we just forever, well, it's weird how it stops on a red screen too, but this is where it just sits here forever and we never get that text. Now I have a hypothesis for what's happening here, but I want to put one more good RAM chip in here. So I'm just going to replace chip number two with a good chip. 
All right, so now we have two good chips and we have one more known bad chip. Okay, we power this up again with two good chips in there and it looks like it's doing exactly the same thing. Now let's take out this last chip that we know is bad and pop in the final good known RAM chip. And now it's doing that quick memory check. And there we go. There it is running the full diagnostic. I'm just gonna power this off really quickly. Now scrolling back, we see it's detected 16 32K blocks. This all looks exactly the same. But the difference is it tests to see if there's a loopback adapter installed and this is not detected. And then immediately it goes on to this, detecting if we have a working raster and then it goes detected. And then after that it says 512K of chip memory and it starts running the rest of the diagnostic. That doesn't seem to happen with these two chips in here. My hypothesis is there are just some memory addresses in here that are weirdly flaky, or perhaps that certain patterns cause like an interference pattern uh, between adjacent cells. And unfortunately, it looks like this RAM test at boot for the diagram is extremely rudimentary. Notice here it's checking address 400, then it goes to 8400, and then it's 10400. It skips large chunks of the RAM. It's only checking on the 32K boundaries. That's all it's doing. And because of that, it's missing that big chunks of these memory chips here are actually probably bad. Well, that part of the diagnostic must be running inside RAM, but it's RAM that's bad and it hadn't detected that it's bad, so it's crashing. And what this really means here is that this diagnostic ROM, even if I had plugged in the serial port, only would have detected that this first chip was bad uh, with assurance here. And then I would have replaced it and just had like a weirdly non-working system. But the, and then the reality is that two more of these chips are so screwed up that the system can't boot or run or do anything and that the RAM test routine in this chip is just not good enough. If I had an Amiga 2000 that had 512K that was in 16 chips, I would have had to socket all of those to figure out which chips are bad because the RAM test in here is just insufficient. Perhaps the maintainers of the Amiga Diag project can create a version that has a much more comprehensive RAM test when you first turn on the machine to help identify exactly which chips are bad so you don't have to go socketing everything like I did here. Well, while I have the diagnostic ROM in there, I do seem to have just enough chips to try out one megabyte in the system. Maybe I don't need any jumpers. Let's give it a try. All right, there we have it. One meg of memory is installed. Let's power this on and see if it detects that one megabyte. All right, it says chip memory 512K, so it did not detect the extra memory. Let's put the original Kickstart ROM back in and see if this thing is actually booting. Kickstart 1.3 is back in. Let's turn it on and I expect to see no weird colors. There it is, Amiga Workbench 1.3. Let me plug that floppy drive back in and see if this thing is booting up now. Well, the floppy drive sounds like it's trying to boot. I'm gonna use a cleaning floppy on it because it's probably dirty on the inside. The machine wasn't filthy when I took the cover off, but it wasn't super clean either. It's detecting the disc, which is a good sign. It sounds like it's working. Let's just take it out, put it back in again. I have an original Amiga Workbench disc. Here we go. Sounds like it's trying to boot. Cool, look, there it is. Is the mouse working? The mouse is working even. Super awesome. Of course, while the Amiga is booting, you can like do stuff. It's in the middle of booting. It's true multitasking, even though this OS is from 1987. Battery backed up clock not found. Yes, indeed, the clock is not there. This particular motherboard revision is actually very similar to the A500 Plus, which also supported one megabyte of chip memory and had a built-in clock right here. So you didn't even need to use the trapdoor memory card to add a clock like this one. But this motherboard is lacking the socket, which would be right around here that would add the clock chip. And there we have it. We have a working Amiga 500 now. Currently free memory is 360,000 bytes. So yeah, about 300 some K. I've been looking around the schematics here to try to find out what jumper I need to change for the one megabyte of RAM. I think this is it right here. Here's the Agnes chip. And right here, address line 19 has a jumper on it, JP2. And it looks like the default configuration, which is one and two, connects address line 19 on the Agnes actually to address line, if we go up here, we can see that this is the address bus on the computer. And by default, that configuration connects address line 19 to address line 23, which I think is for the memory card here when it's set to what, slow RAM, which is the default configuration, or maybe it's like fast RAM. 
Basically, the chip RAM occupies a particular memory space on the Amiga that starts at address zero, and it goes up to, oh, I don't know, whatever. It's continuous space. And it takes this 512K on the memory card here and it maps that into an address space higher up. And that's happened by this remapping. If we change JP2 down to pins two and three, it's gonna connect address line on the Agnes chip to actually address nine on the system, which should allow for a continuous one megabyte of RAM. And right here is that JP2. Now it's hard to tell which is pin one, two, and three on here, but the default was the middle pin and this lower pin were connected together with a little trace. So I used a blade to cut those and then I added a solder blob to the other two. And switching back to Workbench, I have the Amiga connected to the video capture device here. We can now see we actually have the full one megabyte of memory detected by Workbench. Now, just to be sure that this is actually working properly, I have Amiga test kit disk here. So now the system is actually booting. Uh, let's boot this up and that should allow me to do a full RAM diagnostic on the system. All right, so under memory, it should tell us what we have. Yes, one megabyte of chip, zero of fast and zero of slow. Now, I don't know what would happen if I connected RAM to the RAM expansion connector here. I think it might overlap with this memory right here. I think that it's literally one and the same, but I'm not totally sure about that. Anyhow, I'm gonna hit test all memory locations here and let's let this thing run through a full test. Okay, it's gone through 10 loops, no issues. All right, so here's the keyboard test and it definitely doesn't recognize that this is an international keyboard. I don't think there's any way for the Amiga to actually know what keyboard is plugged into it. It's really all a setting in the OS to tell it which international keyboard layout you're using. So I push this key, I'm sure it's just gonna be this blank key right here that's gonna show up. And yeah, it does. So I can just quickly test to make sure that this membrane keyboard at least is registering all the keys. That's it, all the keys work on this board, excellent. Now, speaking of the keyboard and the localization of this machine, it seemed like it was definitely a Spanish keyboard. And the funny thing is, is this is definitely an NTSC motherboard. And I say that because the clock crystal here is slightly different on NTSC machines. And this crystal is 27.636 megahertz. I'm pretty sure the PAL machines have a 28.5 or 28.7 megahertz crystal. It's like a slightly different value. There is a little bit of rust on the edges of this crystal, exactly like there was on the top of that RF shield. So I have a feeling that this motherboard has been in this machine for a long time. So that's gonna be it for this video. Three bad RAM chips in this Amiga 500. And unfortunately, I really couldn't figure out which chips were bad without socketing all four. And that's not something I like to do at all. Definitely looking at the oscilloscope early on in this video, I didn't really see anything that was out of the ordinary. There was that one inverted signal, which was a red herring really. And honestly, this Amiga diagnostic ROM was of limited usefulness. It definitely told me that one of these chips was bad, but the other two, mm, it wasn't really helping with. I also showed in this video that the piggyback method, well, it can work sometimes, doesn't work all the time. And clearly in this case, whatever's wrong with these RAM chips doesn't allow the piggyback method to actually work. So I hope you learned something interesting from this video. And if you liked it, I'd appreciate a thumbs up. But if you didn't, you know what to do. Comments down below. I'd like to hear people's experience with this ROM chip and other RAM diagnostic issues on the Amiga. Perhaps there's something I missed that could have helped me figure out exactly which of these chips was bad without having to socket them all. Check out my second channel if you haven't already. I want to thank my patrons. Their names are scrolling up the side of the screen. And of course, hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. That really helps me out as well. There's merch like shirts like this that you can get. There's a link in the description below. So check that out. And I guess that's going to be that. So stay healthy, stay safe, and I will see you next time. Bye.